Joining us, it's Wednesday. You know what we do. We like to bring him in, Dr. Joe Congeni, Akron Children's Hospital Sports Medicine Center. He's been with us at this time for over 25 years here on WAKR in the mornings with great insight into the world of sports medicine. And, and Joe, I know you have a thing you want to get to here in a moment, but something that's really taking not only the sports world, but it's all over the place as far as news is this Garoppolo injury to the foot. It was diagnosed, he's the quarterback for the 49ers, that he had broken his foot with a Lus Frank uh, break. Now, I'm going to let you get into this. This is out of my lane to say, but they're saying when that happens, he was done for the year, six-month rehabilitation. And then the doctors went in yesterday and say, hey, it's not broke, and he can still recover. So talk about that break, that type of break, how, debilit- how de- uh, 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 debilitating it can be and how it could have been maybe broken but not. Take us into that area of the foot. Yeah, Ray, thanks. It's a part of the foot called the midfoot. So instead of being an ankle sprain, up in the ankle that we see so much sprains and high sprains and things, this is in the middle part of the foot. And as athletes wear shoes and things and with less and less support, we have seen more Liz Frank injuries. And we call it a Liz Frank fracture, and the name, believe it or not, goes all the way back to a French general in Napoleon's army. And they used to get it when they were jousting, and their foot would get caught in the stirrup, and they would twist the foot funny and break the foot in a way called a Liz Frank fracture. And here it is. Uh, centuries later, and we still use the word Liz Frank. I think it makes us feel smart when we use big words like that in medicine and sports medicine. So still use Liz Frank. It's a twisting injury of the foot, Ray, and it's really more of a big injury to the ligaments that hold those five bones in the foot together. And when it's a a bad partial tear, it swells a lot, but sometimes if it doesn't tear all the way, you won't see the, bro- the bone spread out and break. And if it's a partial tear, and a lot of bad partial tears swell a lot, we think they may be broken initially, and then when we get a better look at another MRI and as the swelling goes down, we see, hey, maybe this is not a complete fracture and tear of the ligament, and it could heal on its own. And that's some of the talk of what they're talking with Jimmy G and six to eight weeks and possibly playing in the playoffs versus when you have to have surgery on this thing, Ray, you can really count on a minimum of four to six months of being out with a Liz Frank twisting injury, big swollen foot, torn ligament, bony injury that widens the bones in the foot. And athletes just can't push off if they fully tear it and break it. And yet, if there, if it was not fully uh, fractured, which is what we heard yesterday, uh, the body can heal it with good rehab in six to eight weeks. So we may see him again this year. Interesting. Well, Joe, last night, Lakers were up in Cleveland taking on our Cavs. The Cavaliers took them down, 116-102. But our good friend LeBron, 21 points, 17 rebounds. He still shows up each and every game. And I know you wanted to go down the LeBron James path today. Yeah, you know that so many athletes we see in their 30s and past 35 and stuff like that, they kind of, I'd call it maybe limp to the finish line. They play a lesser role in things. But, oh, my gosh, you watch this guy play, and he's still in the top five, eight players in the NBA. There's no doubt about it. Everybody talks about that. So here's this guy, LeBron James, few statistics on him that just got me. I know you know this because you stay up on things so much better than me, Ray, but he's going to be 38 years old in two weeks and he has been in the nba now 20 years uh later in this year he probably he will pass uh kareem abdul jabbar to be the all-time leading scorer in the history of the nba yes this akron kid will be the all-time leading scorer in the nba you know he now has 19 years in a row since his rookie year. He's averaged greater than 25 points a game. So incredible longevity. Hey, there's another guy, Tom Brady, they talk about this, Serena Williams and others. And one of the things they've done is that that group, and particularly will focus on LeBron, has improved performance, but also inc- improved longevity uh, and availability, staying healthy. And they've done that. They've pushed the sports scientists to come up with new ways to keep themselves healthy and elongate their careers and improve the longevity. This is called, Ray, in sports medicine, the longevity revolution. 
It's the longevity revolution, and LeBron's right in the middle of it, this kid from Akron. And it does things like uh, avoiding injuries uh, that uh, can that, that, that can have uh, long-lasting uh, effects on your body and um, different foods to avoid or different foods to highlight that you should be taking, um, about conditioning muscles more efficiently uh, when you're in season, and multiple recovery techniques. So this trickles down to kids. So we certainly see it in the college population. We certainly even see it in high school and even in youth sports. So I want to talk about three parts to it, Ray. Number one is testing. And in this area of the longevity revolution, as they try to prolong careers as well as improve performance, is some of what they do is they do a lot of testing, uh, blood testing, where they look at certain biomarkers that give us an idea of how we're doing with nutrition and other things. Uh, I didn't, don't want to get into all the details today, but testing is part of it. Another type of testing is performance testing, where they analyze movement patterns. So testing, number one, is a big part of this longevity movement. Number two is training. And you know there's multiple techniques for training. Um, some of these have been tested. Many have no research at all and that fly by the seat of their pants. And unfortunately, in a clinic like mine, I see a lot of people who are injured from trying to be on uh, training techniques that are not as healthy for their body, especially young athletes. So we've got to be real careful in that realm. And thirdly is the recovery aspect. And really two major parts of the recovery aspect is after high-intensity sports involvement is, number one, cryotherapy, um, where we get into sub-zero uh, temperatures to reduce the inflammation and the muscle soreness. Remember the day that down on Route 18, there were, this was many years ago, it was in its infancy, and people were going into these cryotherapy units. By the way, if you want one at home, Ray, they're $50,000 for a home unit, and the walk-in units are $100,000. You can get one in the Horner household. I'll take two. The, <laughs> the other area is what's called hyperbaric oxygen chambers. And a lot of athletes, after high-intensity games and playing, they use uh, high, hyperbaric oxygen chambers. Not much research there at all. A lot of anecdotal stuff that it works, but also some that it might not be as healthy. So the point for us is that for young athletes, uh, we need a more sensible approach to performance centers, and we need it often to be medically based with some good research behind it. Many of the children's hospitals in Ohio have really jumped in. We all kind of have those. We've really been developing ours at Akron Children's where it's a medically based performance program with good research behind it. We work with a lot of the performance trainers and training people in the community that are already doing a good job. But at Nationwide Children's in Columbus and Cincinnati Children's and many of us are involved because we don't want our athletes to get hurt doing things that could actually uh, injure and, and um, young athletes. So let's not experiment with our young athletes on a lot of these things. But I do want to say that LeBron James, right from our own hometown, along with others, as I mentioned, have really pushed the sports scientists into this longevity revolution. And it's been kind of an interesting 20 years as people have tried to not only improve performance, but improve longevity and stay injury-free. And it's been a really interesting time in that way. Well, that's a training. And, Joe, too, it's also the diets, too. When you look at the current athletes, they're really watching a lot better than the athletes did maybe of the 60s and 70s of their intake and taking care of the bodies with their diets. You are so right. And there's a, there is, a, there is some, a good body of research in that area of what is a good fuel to use. You talk about fueling yourself yeah. for sports participation. And we've come light years in that area, Ray, as well. And so you see people playing into their late 30s at high levels or quarterbacks playing in their 40s. Oh, yeah. my gosh. <laughs> and so part of it is the fueling of of nutrition as well, Ray. You're absolutely right. Well, good visit, my friend. Great insight into the world of sports medicine again, as always. Joe, thanks for the time this morning. Thanks, Ray. Great talking to you. Have a great week. You too, my friend. Dr. Joe Congeni, Sports Medicine Center, Akron Children's Hospital, joining us live.